Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace and blessings be upon every one of you. We begin in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most gracious, and the most compassionate. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inahu wa nasta'afiruhu. Wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. Man yadihi allahu falamudilla lahu wa man yudlilhu falahadiyala. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lahu. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All praise is due to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray, and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no other God but Allah, the one who has no partner. And I bear witness that his prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, is Allah's servant and messenger. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullah wa koolu qawlan sadeeda yuslih lakum a'amalakum wa yaghfir lakum bhunubakum wa man yuta'illaha wa rasooluhu faqad faza fawzan azeema O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah. Be mindful of Allah and say what is right. Allah will bless your deeds for you and forgive your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger of Allah has truly achieved a great triumph. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullah haqqa tukatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah. Be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves. Do not die except in a full state of submission to Allah. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa ahlul uqtata min lisani yafqahu qawli. Again, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu to everyone. Jumma Mubarak. It's so good to see you all in the space for those of you who are able to join us here, for those of you who may see this later on, um, and for those who weren't able to be in the space today, uh, we pray that Allah receives and finds you all well and gives you the full blessings of this day. So our topic that, we, uh, that we're lifting up today is one that we probably think about a lot, we probably talk about it a lot, we probably, um, you know, hear it in our conversations a lot, but it's something that we probably do a lot less of. Um, and the topic today, inshallah, is the concept of prophetic rest. And you might be wondering, what's the difference between traditional rest and prophetic rest? And, you know, when we talk about rest, you know, we, 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 we lift up this element of uh, cessation of work or just leaving uh, any kind of busyness in a sense in order to relax oneself, in order to refresh oneself, in order to recover or recuperate. Um, and, and this rest can oftentimes be uh, stereotyped to just seem like a hammock in between two trees or a bed uh, with a pillow and blanket on it or, you know, a, uh, a lawn chair kind of at the beach and, you know, a nice glass uh, with some good juice or something and just relaxing watching the sunset. There's so many different concepts of what rest can look like for us and what we may think about rest. But when we say prophetic rest, we lift up this aspect of the sunnah, of the example of the Prophet Sallallahu which we oftentimes may be guilty of, of saying it's uh, the sunnah is just with matters of faith, or it's just with respect to the rituals of our faith, how we pray, how we fast, how we dress, all these different things. But What's curious to note is that the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the Quran lifts up as the best example, the best model for humanity, is one that goes above and beyond just the rituals. It's not limited to just that which we do on a prayer mat or that which we do on Fridays or that which we do in Ramadan. This example, this uswatun hasana, is something that is part and parcel of each and every one of our days and every one of our existences. And so when we look at it, when we treat, when we tend to think of our faith or our uh, beliefs or our Islam, we may limit it to these uh, certain spaces, to the prayer mat, to the Friday gatherings at the mosque, to the uh, fasting and, and the, the tarawees in the uh, month of Ramadan. We may sometimes tend to do that. But what the example of the Prophet shows is that it's actually Islam is something that pervades across. Islam happens with each and every breath. Islam happens from the moment your eyes are opened uh, when you're given birth to the moment your eyes close when you pass away. Islam is throughout and part and parcel. So when we talk about prophetic rest, 
we tie in this element that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi beyond someone who was a messenger of God, someone who was responsible with conveying the scripture uh, of Allah, with conveying the message of Allah, was also someone who was a human being in every sense of the word, was someone who ate, was someone who slept, was someone who was happy, was someone who joked, was someone who felt sad, was someone who experienced loss, and was also someone who rested. Uh, and as I mentioned, in this aspect of rest, when we think about what was what is traditional rest, when I ask each and every one of you, if you can tell me what is rest to you, or what, what does rest connotate for you, we'll probably get a myriad of answers. Each of us are different people, and different things are restful to each of us. Some of us may think that, hey, it's probably restful for me just to take a nap every, every day in the afternoon. Some of us may think that, hey, I like to just like uh, you know, decompress by just watching some TV. Some of us may think that uh, I like to go for a walk or others of us may go uh, out to eat or someplace, just spend some time with family, whatever it may be. The point being that our concept and our notion of rest within ourselves is dynamic um, as we look at it on the whole. But for ourselves, for each of us individually, Sometimes that rest can become static. Sometimes that rest can just, we can think that the only thing we need to be restful or the only thing that we can get uh, in order to be at rest is this one thing or this certain thing. Uh, and there's a book I'd like to lift up uh, just as a alternate way of seeing things. We'll, we'll talk about the prophetic aspect in just a second, but there's a book by Alex Pang called Rest. Um, and what Alex Pang lifts up and what kind of pushes back on is our traditional societal notion of work and productivity that we sometimes link increased amount of work or longer hours at work or more uh, work per se as being more productive and pushes back on this because of how in the past, how in other people's lives, how people who we see as paragons um, of society in terms of landmark achievements and whatnot, uh, this had a very different connotation that rest that that productivity was not just the most amount of work you could do, but in terms of the best amount of work you could do while incorporating so many different aspects of rest and uh, livelihoodness uh, or liveliness in your life. Um, so you have examples of people that would intentionally work very intensely and intentionally for a first few hours of their day, and then the rest of their day was doing things that uh, fed the soul, that that gave meaning and other aspects to their life and to the people around them. So when we think about this concept of rest, uh, we, we, we look at uh, the Prophet ﷺ, who we believe to be a fully actualized human being as someone who's an example for humanity, and even in whose rest or whose downtime we can draw some benefit from. But what is the element of this prophetic rest that is different from traditional rest? And what I'll lift up is just a simple verse of the Quran that uh, that many of us have heard, many of us may be internalized, and many of us kind of aspire for. But it's the it's the verse from Surah Rad that says that verily in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find rest. And we think of this in the aspect of the spiritual heart, that in the, in the spiritual sense that the remembrance of Allah is that which causes the heart to rest, which causes the soul to be at rest. And, and there's so many layers to that that you can kind of peel away and thinking, what does the remembrance of a deity or the remembrance of a God, a sovereign, all-powerful God, uh, all-compassionate, all-merciful God, how does that contribute to my soul being at rest? We can always dive down there. But to take this at, at, its, at, its, uh, at its face, value per se, that the remembrance of Allah, in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find rest. We see that when our hearts are at rest, our spirits are at rest, our outside will also reflect that as well. When our inside is at calm, when our inside is at peace, the actions that we'll take will also emanate that, and they'll be informed by that space as well. So when we see the prophet's rest, we see that as we'll go through a few examples of it, that this was rest that did not negate the remembrance of Allah. Oftentimes when we see in our society that people have had a rough week at work, they may be working 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 hours, they may be burnt out, uh, and their concept of rest may be very warped in that sense, that because I'm not able to do this at work or because I've been worked this much, now I'm going to go do something that's in, in, really crazy, and it results in people maybe uh, doing some high-risk activities, people maybe uh, going uh, to places and 
and becoming inebriated, becoming intoxicated, uh, and, and creating a lot of other harms, but as a form of release, that this is a form of just rest, you know, for, 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 that, for that sense. But there's other folks as well that will just kind of go to the other side of the spectrum and not have any rest, saying, no, I can't, like, I have to do uh, ex every single thing I can. Um, I don't have time to give my body that space. And, and we know in our tradition, as well as just in the concept of biological sciences, that when our out our corporeal bodies, when we ourselves are not rested, when we ourselves are not giving our bodies what they are due, what they need, um, we will see our other faculties start to deteriorate. Rest, when we think about it in a holistic sense, is something that is vital for better mental health, for uh, your concentration, for your immune system, for your digestive system, for your mood or your metabolism. All these different things are impacted by sleep, impacted by rest, but sometimes we don't give it that due. And so to think about about when we give our rest substance, when we make our rest something substantive, we will start to see the impact as well on the rest of us. So whatever we take in as well as well as what we put out will be harmonized and have that benefit. We see with respect to the concept of rest uh, as well when we look at the prophetic element that it, it, it wasn't one that was just focused in the remembrance of Allah or just had the remembrance of Allah, but it also had other things with it that set it apart from what we may traditionally now note as rest. So our challenge today, inshallah, is to think about the ways that each of us rests and uh, the respective ways that we are able to rest, given our physical uh, limitations, given just uh, our personal predispositions. Some of us like spending time with other people. Some of us like to just kind of be on our own, wherever we might kind of be. But to look at our concepts of rest and our ways of rest and thinking, how can we maybe make it a little bit more substantive, a little bit more purposeful, and a little bit more intentional in the way the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, did to have that derived benefit of not just a better restful experience, but one that then emanates and goes forth to the rest of our bodies. Because as I mentioned, we are like, uh, the, our bodies are kind of like rental cars. Uh, we have leased them from God. We are uh, driving these rental cars around and eventually we'll have to return these bodies. These bodies will return. Uh, no body is 100% uh, is perfect and these bodies will be returned and we'll be accountable to how did we treat this body. Uh, there's a verse in the Quran that says, verily every soul shall taste death. And there's a commentary on this that the tasting of death is actually a continual action, that verily every soul is tasting death. So from the moment we were born, our body's body clock is kind of starting to tick. And so uh, we are all going to end up in a space where these bodies no longer will be. So they are something right now, and they will be nothing at the end of the line. So when we get to that point, what have we done when we are asked by God, what have, what did you do with this body I gave you, with the um, with the abilities I gave you, with the faculties I gave you, what, what did you do with them? Um, to think about how rest also plays into that. So without further ado, just jumping into the uh, aspect of the Prophet Sallallahu we have in the uh, early biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the biography that uh, we, we start with the prophetic revelation just right before that, we see this uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was someone who was a family man, was someone who had kids, he had a wife, he was someone who was a working person, he was working for his wife's business, he was a community man, he was someone resolving community disputes, he was uh, actively involved in his work, he was a merchant, he was trading, he was, you know, going with caravans, traveling a lot, obviously, uh, in the in the in the space of Mecca, which is this, you know, busy cosmopolitan, you know, uh, kind of market driven town, there's obviously a lot of that element to it. And it still continues to this day that Mecca still has that being center of commerce. And so think about a society that's so busy, that has all these different things kind of happening. And towards, for one reason or another, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi towards his kind of 40s, starts to, or a little bit earlier than that, starts to kind of check out, um, you know, whether that is from burnout from working, whether that's just because the society itself is becoming an unpleasant place to be, or whether that is because just life itself is, is getting kind of tiring. You know, the process for one reason or another starts to retreat, starts to take a space away. And we know the famous uh, kind of narrations of him taking these spiritual retreats to Jabal Nur or to the Mount of Light, going to Ghar -e Hira, or the cave of Hira. If you've been to Mecca, if you've been to Umrah, if you've been to Hajj, or if you have Google Maps, you can take a look and see how far the Kaaba is from this mountain and from this cave. It's quite a trek. Um, getting to it by car is, is, is something that's uh, an experience of itself, but to get there by foot and to do it regularly. The Prophet Muhammad was someone who would, in this time, 
time period go regularly. He would go uh, on weekly bases. He would go sometimes days on end. He would sometimes go for weeks on end, um, but he would go there frequently uh, as he was kind of approaching this age. And so uh, he starts to kind of distance himself from that space. But you can see this as an element of rest, but we can just say, hey, he was just kind of leaving everything like behind. He was just putting it to the side and he's just kind of focusing on himself and retreating. Sometimes we romanticize it, that the Prophet Sallallahu was just someone who was becoming disillusioned with this world. He was kind of becoming an ascetic. He leaves everything here and he just goes for the worship of God or the remembrance of God. And he's sitting in this cave by himself. But what I want to argue as well is that this rest that the Prophet Sallallahu is taking, this retreat that he's taking is one that is still mindful of other people, is one that is still ingrained in the well-being of other people. And why do I say that? The Prophet Muhammad was someone at this time, just because he was going on a retreat, didn't mean that he wasn't a, uh, a father, didn't mean he wasn't a husband, didn't mean he didn't have the obligations that he had, didn't mean his family had to eat. You know, all these things were still realities. These, still, these things still had to happen. And we know from later narrations of Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, that when people asked her, what would he do at home? What does he do? We know what he does in the mosque, but what would he do at home? She related that he was someone who would stitch his garments. He was someone who fixed his own clothes. He would milk his own goat. He would prepare his own meals. He would do his own chores. This was the kind of person who uh, was there when he was at the height of his commu of the community's power in, in, in terms of the structure. And to think about him in this setting as well, that this would not be a completely different person from who is there in that, in that town of Mecca with his family. So thinking about what enabled the Prophet Muhammad to be able to leave the well-being as family, leave the security and the taking care of his family as he's going on this retreat. And what, what we lift up in this aspect, apart from the intentional retreat, the Prophet is also, we can, in, we can infer that the Prophet is also communicating with his wife. He's communicating with Khadija. He's maintaining active communication. And why is that? Because Khadija prepared and actively prepared meals, supplies, kits, whatever you want to call it, for the times he would be traveling, for the times he would be away. She would prepare these things for his retreats. And she understood his need to kind of space out from this from this world at the time, to, to space out from the busyness of life. And she helped facilitate it. She helped be um, a supportive person in that aspect. So we can infer that he didn't just pick up things one day and say, hey, I'm leaving, and then leaves Khadija with all the kids and all the business and everything. No, we can infer that uh, you know he, he wasn't someone that was absent of the needs of his family. So the rest that he wanted for himself, the rest that he lifted up for himself, included the needs of his family. And so when he takes that, uh, when he goes to uh, Ghare Hira, when he goes to Jabal Nur and has the spiritual retreat, we can see this indicated that he didn't forget his family. He didn't forget the needs of his family or the concern of his family. Uh, his family was at the forefront of his mind. And how do we know that? When revelation first came, he had this angelic experience. His first reaction was not to run back to Mecca to be with his tribe or to be with his boys or to be with his, his, his the, the people he knew or any of these other folks, the, the instant response was to go back to his rock, to his family, and to his confidant in Khadija. His first reaction was to go to her before anybody else. And so you see this concern of not just this well-being, but you see the care that she reciprocated onto him, that there was a mutual relationship where he, when in, in acting on his rest, did not forget her needs or did not forget the needs of his family as well. So when we think about this rest, obviously, when he's in this moment of, uh, in the spiritual retreat, there the, the, the scholars commentate how it is uh, him seeking to connect to God. He's seeking to connect to something beyond what he's kind of seeing here. So there is that element of seeking uh, and wanting to connect with God and remembering God. So we have that element of remembering how, uh, Allah facilitates rest in the hearts. But then we also see the other element of prophetic rest is to not be unmindful of other creation, not be unmindful of the blessings and the people that are around us. Because oftentimes when we want to take rest for ourselves, we say, hey, I deserve this and I will just do whatever I need to do to rest. And we probably won't think about what do our spouses need? What do the people around us need? What do our coworkers need? What, what, what do all these other moving parts in our life need? And we will just kind of say, yeah, we need rest and we're just going to go here and ignore that. Um, the Prophet Sallallahu rest, as substantive as it was, was one that was not divorced from the well-being of the community as well as, as well as his loved ones. So these two basic foundational elements, you have the remembrance of God, and you have the incorporation and the communication with other people, but also the third most important thing, setting that boundary. Sometimes the hardest thing to do in bringing on rest and to taking on rest, whatever that looks like for you, is to 
say that I'm going to do it is to actually do it. Uh, and you see in the process of his life, he he did it. He 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 was in this early, in this early part. And we'll cover one other part of the prophet's life, but he actually did it. He 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 didn't just you know do it gung ho and kind of do it on his own. Um, but he did it in a way that brought in and incorporated his family. His wife was helping to uh, facilitate what he needed to make this a substantive retreat. Um, he probably took care and uh, you know made some way to take care of the affairs of the family so that they were still being fed, um, that there was some way that business continued because they weren't just living in poverty when he left, that there was something that was happening, whether communicating with the rest of his tribe or his trusted people. So he was taking care of the needs of his family, but he didn't do it at the expense of everybody else. So looking at this aspect as well, that the Prophet Muhammad set these boundaries, he set this space for himself, but he did it with a degree of mindfulness. So we want to lift up this aspect that prophetic rest, if we want to equate it to something, this prophetic rest is mindful rest. And later on in the life of the Prophet, as we mentioned, rest for each and every one of us on this call may look very different um, from what we might conceive of it or what we might think of it. But to look at uh, the example of the Prophet Muhammad as well as someone who is a dynamic person. The Prophet was someone who experienced transition. He experienced changes. He experienced uh, loss in his life. He had to uproot from his home. He had to uh, go through different trials. His wife passed away. His loved ones passed away. His kids passed away. All these different things. His, his profession in and of itself changed. He no longer was just an ordinary shepherd or a businessman, but now he was a community leader. He's, he's, he's changing these aspects, and as such, the, the way he rests also changes. So we don't see him just do these kind of long spiritual retreats going into Medina in a sense of, of, of what he did in Mecca, but we see him incorporate other elements of rest or other activities to have restful elements. We see him that he's a family man. We see him that he's someone who's involved in his community. He's someone that is involved in the religious and spiritual life. He's someone who's involved in every aspect here, yet he was someone who still made time to find rest. How did he do that? His uh, companions relate how he would set a portion of the day for each thing, basically. So he would divide his uh, his his day into thirds. The first day uh, or the first part of the day, he would spend, you know, with people, uh, the people around, or he would spend with his family. He, the other part of the day, he would spend with himself or just give him his meantime. And the other part of the day, he would spend for the worship of Allah. So you see this kind of intentional demarcations where people knew that, hey, this is the time the prophet's with his family. This is the time he's spending with himself. This is the time that he's, um, you know, worshiping a lot, that he set those boundaries that were there. But his way of resting became dynamic. As I said, he's a family man. He's a community man. He's all these different things. But he, his, his concept of rest was not static. He wasn't that, oh, man, you know, I can't get that spiritual retreat I used to do back in Mecca. Um, I don't think I can rest now. No, he would, in his family time, he would find elements to rest. He would race his wife, Aisha, on, uh, and, you know, on, on, in the alleys. He would, he would it, do these fun activities. He would laugh with the kids. He would uh, joke and play with the children of the neighborhood. He would, uh, you know, gather his companions to have a, uh, a meal in which they can eat. He would visit with people who are sick. He would find different things to do that we may sometimes see as tasks or obligations or burdens, and he would find restful elements within them. So he would be intentional to these spaces but finding ways to uh, incorporate that rest. But that's not to say that he didn't demarcate uh, a space for himself. He was someone who did nap. He did take, uh, he would take a regular rest. He would take a nap. He would um, have these aspects as well. But his, he, was, he was always refreshed because his prayer, his, his other activities that he did in, kind of fed that aspect of rest. So when we think about the routine of the prophet as a dynamic person, we look at how he rested, not just stay static, but he found a way to make these activities restful in a sense with that boundary setting. So it began with him setting those boundaries of what he does in a certain portion of the day, what he does in another portion and what he does in another portion. But it also went into the substance of that uh, action that he was doing. Remembering that rest, if we are looking at it from an apparatus standpoint, the foundation of rest, we want intentional mindful rest is in the remembrance of God. And from that, becoming mindful as well. If you're remembering of Allah, you remember the creatures, you remember the people who are dependent on you, you remember the environment that you're in. And from there as well, setting the boundary of, of setting that intention of doing uh, the, the actual resting, the doing of this, this taking the initiative on, uh, and then kind of seeing the growth from there. So you see this in this person 
who then goes uh, into this new society, into this new city, into this new place, and to be able to incorporate that in his life there. And so we see when the, the companions related that he would be somebody that uh, we could sit with, we could talk with, he would have a, a meal with us, he would talk to us about you know politics, he would talk to us about all these different things, the favorite foods, leisure activities, all that. But uh, these would be restful occasions for the prophet. They wouldn't be stressful occasions, they'd be restful occasions because they were, as later traditions narrate, that uh, these, were, these were gatherings, these were actions, these were moments where God was remembered where piety was observed, where respect was observed. These were things that uh, emanated from these different spaces, whether they were intimate interactions with the prophet or whether they were uh, substantive fun things, whether they were jokes, whether they were uh, difficult moments, whatever they would be, we see that each of them informed a this element of rest. So in closing, inshallah, what I want to lift up is that asking ourselves, what do we think of when we think about rest? What comes to mind for us? Where, where does our mind go when we think about what is restful for us or whatnot? Um, society and our current framework maybe tells us that rest is only something that happens outside of work or is something that uh, can happen. And we, we've kind of fractured ourselves into these different spaces. But where, where can we truly find rest within those things that have been deemed for us as unrestful? People, society on outside will say that, uh, how are you going to find rest? You've got, you know, your kids at home, you've got your work, you've got all this stuff kind of going on. How are you even going to get a chance to rest? And to instead push back on that and saying, how can we make some of these activities or at least some of the elements of these restful? When the prophet was playing with those kids, when the prophet was having uh, a fun time uh, racing his wife, when he was having these different activities um, with his family, when he was being there for his community, when he was being there as a statesman, when he's being there in these different obligations, when he's praying, when he's observing the rituals of his faith, he was finding elements of rest and he was resting, not in the sense of just the spiritual space, but also to the outside, which is why you see the prophet was narrated as someone that would be not seen without smiling, that there was no person seen in that society who would smile more than the prophet, who would have a cheerful countenance, who would emanate this kind of positivity. Um, that rarely comes from someone who doesn't get a lot of rest. And we see that this was still somebody who would not sleep a full night because he's praying for much of the night. He's doing all of these different things. You would imagine him to be a pretty, uh, you know, kind of unpleasant person in, in the sense of he's doing all of these things on repeat day after day. We see this in some of our leaders and some of our fellow, uh, you know, Muslims and whatnot who are doing so much, but their 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 demeanor becomes very negative. Their, their, uh, the way they treat other people is very kind of harsh. But you see how the Prophet was still doing all of these things and more, and yet still maintained that positivity, still felt rejuvenated, still felt rested because of the fact that it wasn't so much about what's on the outside. It's what's being informed on the inside. And uh, at the end of the day, that remembrance, that mindfulness that, that underlies our rest informs how we then view all the other things that come to us in our life. So inshallah, we ask Allah that in the things that we do, in the things that society has told us are burdensome, in the things that society has told us that we can't find rest in, we ask Allah to help us find rest as the Prophet Muhammad did. We ask Allah to make each and every one of our endeavors of rest one that is not divorced from the remembrance of Allah. To remember that as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did in his prophetic rest, there was the foundational stone of the connection to Allah. And building on that, that Allah make us mindful of the people that our rest is not divorced from the well-being of those who are around us, that we care for ourselves, but we do so uh, mindful of those who we are caring for. And we ask Allah to enable us to have the courage, to have the audacity, to have the strength, uh, to have the initiative, as the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam did, to take that rest, to make the initiative, and to tell the world, to tell the worldly elements in our life that uh, we that that we we have this right that we will take that space for ourselves for our family and for God and we ask Allah to make these things easy we ask Allah to heal those of us who are going through difficult times right now who are recovering who are uh, in a space where health may not be of benefit to enable us to find rest even if not physically in the spiritual sense and to be enablers of rest as Khadija was for our prophet as all of the supportive elements in our prophet's life was as the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi himself was for other people to become enablers of this rest for one another and we ask Allah to allow us to leave this Jummah 
inshallah, better than we came to it and to enter the next Jummah better than we've left this one. Inshallah, wa akhru wa da'wana and alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Again, a blessing to you all. Jummah Mubarak and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.